Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Are you happy to be here? Yes. Yeah. All right. Give yourself a hand for being happy. We should all be happy. Welcome to Unity in Ashland. I see faces I haven't seen before, so you may not be familiar with us. How many are here for the very, very first time? Oh, lots of you. Wow. Well, because we have quite a few, sometimes we have you... Share your name and your social security number and your credit card number. <laughs> but because there are quite a few, I think we won't take the time to do that. But just raise your hand one more time so the rest of us can see who to really welcome back there. And let's give them a hand. <laughs> yes, and after, after the service, we all have time to go back there and enjoy some refreshments and get to know each other. So we can get to know each other then. But we're really glad that you're here for the first time or the second or the hundredth or whatever. And we hope you'll come back. We like to start with some announcements, and we have a prayer circle that meets every Monday at, one, at five o'clock, right here at the Havara in the back room. And you're welcome to attend. You're welcome to fill out a prayer request form on the back table and put it in the prayer box, and it'll be prayed for, and then sent on to Silent Unity to be prayed for for a full month. So that's a wonderful way if you're trying to manifest or trying to heal or just want to be prayed for. Okay, so as I said, we'll have refreshments back there after the service. It's important that we not bring food onto the carpeted area. And so if you have little children that have little cookie crumbles in their hands, or adults that like cookie crumbles, <laughs> encourage them not to come onto the carpeted area with that. That's the way the cookie crumbles. That is, yes. <laughs> and it does crumble, trust, trust those of us who clean up. <laughs> okay, um... Well, let's see. There's also going to be an extra table back there with some information about the history of the Civil Rights Movement because we're going to be hearing about the Civil Rights Movement today. Norman's talk actually is entitled, See the God in Each Other. You know, some of you may actually imagine that you hear God's voice on the other end of your cell phone, right? You may even imagine that God is reading your text. Well, he might be. And we don't believe in a vengeful God, but just in case we're wrong about that, you don't want to take a chance of leaving your cell phone off because he's watching you. So, this is your opportunity to turn your cell phones off. Next week is Norma's last week before her sabbatical, so we want to make sure that all of you and all of your friends and everyone you've ever met in your life comes back. Because, really, everyone. Because we want to fill this place. It's going to be a very celebratory time. We're going to have dances of universal peace and lots of fun things. So... Not that we're happy to see her leave, but we are happy that she's going to have a few months of just rest and relaxation. So please come and join us next week. We also are going to have a special musician next week. Uh, her name is Ani Williams, and she is a harpist and a vocalist. She's also going to be doing a concert that afternoon. Now, I understand that Ani is from France and that she is into the Mary Magdalene tradition. So that's going to be a wonderful thing you don't want to miss as well. She's also going to do a concert that afternoon at the Headwaters at 4 o'clock. So we want to support her in that. She's absolutely wonderful. She's uh, done many albums. She did a couple of them in my studio, and I get to play with her, and we get to play together next weekend. Yay. All right, sounds wonderful. And of course, we're always excited to have our own musicians here today, Richard and David Gabriel and Larry. I know that Roy wants to make an announcement about the Siski violins. You want to use the mic? Yes. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> yes, you did. You stepped on my court. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, there are a few of these flyers on the back table. And uh, the Siski violins, which is a youth ensemble, age from 9 to 19, uh, will be performing at the Criterion Theater this coming Friday evening, and a matinee performance February 8th at SOU. They are world class. There's a picture that's kids from the Rogue Valley. It's a picture of their performing at Carnegie Hall uh, in 2012. They were amazing back there. And they went back to Carnegie Hall, and I noticed in a rehearsal recently, they brought some of Carnegie Hall back with them. You'll hear it at the uh, Criterion Friday night. And besides the ensemble, there'll be special young soloists from the area, uh, such as Gabe Young, uh, amazing oboist, uh, Ty Austin, classical guitar, 
backed up by violins, uh, Paul Schubert, uh, on cello, and a soprano, Lauren Green, a student of Laura DeRocher's, who will be singing two songs from uh, Phantom of the Opera, it'll thrill you, backed up by violins. Don't miss it. Go to both. It's only $15 each. It is no better deal in the, for the year. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. And we are going to have some fanta fantastic, fantabulous, whatever, speakers while Norma is gone, too. And so just to, uh, to let you know about February, we want you to keep coming. Come in February, we have M. Claire, who is the, an American poet, local. She's going to be presenting on the first week, and then the next week we have Jeff Golden, the next week Laura DeRocher, and the week after that Susan Mathis McQueen. So you want to keep coming through the month of February. I'm going to take an opportunity, actually, to bless the children. Do we have any children, or particularly short people, <laughs> who would like to come forward and be blessed? Okay. Any other children that would like to come forward and be blessed? Well, we can bless you from back there. There's some back there. You want to run up here and be blessed? Run, run, run. Know any short people jokes in the meantime? There they come. Yes, we're always happy to have children because children are our future. We want to definitely infuse them with the energy that we have here. <coughs> And while the others are coming up, just want to remind you, do you know what tomorrow is? Martin Luther King Day, you already know that. And there's a wonderful celebration at the armory, the historic armory, right on the corner of Oak and B Street, about Martin Luther King. And so I'm going to encourage all the children to have their parents take them there tomorrow. It's really a wonderful event. You need to get there to line up by 11. It starts at noon, but it gets very, very crowded, so... That would be a wonderful way for you to learn even more about Martin Luther King and the wonderful things he did on the planet. So, together we'd like to rub our hands together and get the energy flowing and just send that energy to each of these beautiful children and children all over the world as well. And together we say, we love you, we appreciate you, and we behold the Christ light shining in you. All right. Is Patrice here for the children? I just saw her drive up. <laughs> okay, kids, maybe you want to wait in the back there and she'll be right in and take you to a wonderful class. And now I'm going to turn this over to Reverend Norma. Let's welcome Reverend Norma. So glad to see you all here today. It's a great time to be together when we are ignited in our souls to think about activism in this world and that we actually have a spiritual power. They say that the spiritual power is greater than the principalities and powers of this world. And we're here today to remind one another of what resides within us. So it's exciting to be here and to, to think into your life about what is the dream that you've been living out, and perhaps, depending on the age you are, you have accomplished a lot of it, and if so, then you are one of the leaders. And if you're here as a young person who is feeling into your dreams, you're here as a leader too, but you've got a lot of support. This is a community of people that I'm looking out on right here who have felt the spiritual inspiration to stand up for what's right in this world. And I know, I know a lot of you, and I know that you've done amazing things to stand, to stand for justice, to stand for restorative justice for all. So I'm really thankful to be here in your midst today. We're doing something here. A ritual is an activity that actually raises energy and uh, brings it through us and has an effect on the world. So I'm thankful for you to be here together today to do something to what we accomplish here. As it says in Buddhism, may all sentient beings be blessed by what we do here today. And I am thrilled, it's a really big blessing today that we have Natalie Tyler and her husband John, and Natalie's going to be speaking in part of the service today to tell her story about actually having been with Dr. Martin Luther King 
on several occasions and actually having him in her home in Cincinnati, Ohio. So she knew him, has first-hand experience in being in the marches, and I'm thrilled to have you here today so that we can touch into it in that very real way. Um, very excited to be here with you today, and um, I'm really excited to have David and Laura and Richard leading us in some Negro spirituals and some really great music, so get ready to sing. <laughs> Je ne sais pas quoi un Negro spiritual. That's a thing. This is a song I wrote a while back. I think it's the mic cord. Can we use a different mic? Can we get a different mic? Can I get an amen? <laughs> so I'll just speak a little bit. Um, I have I have a dream, and this was right around the time of, of Martin Luther King's birthday, uh, a number of years ago. I had a dream of where we were finding a way to feed everyone, and we were finding a way to take care of everyone. And um, I don't want to bore you with all the details, but what happened was I woke up crying. But it was one of those crying things that felt so good, so complete, like I felt so at peace with this, this expression of emotion. The rhythm of the crying that I was doing was uh, 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 like that. It was like six, eight time. <laughs> You'd have to figure, I'm a drummer, I've been a drummer since I'm like eight years old. So this dream would have to have some sort of time signature uh, in order for me to really get it. So um, I wrote down some of those ideas and um, they came out in this song. I think we're good. That was good film. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was going to say that anyway. Are you over there, Richard? I was here.
our actions, as David's song said. Dreams are seeds. We plant them. They're planted in us, perhaps by the divine, by a prophetic inclination. And those seeds bring forth fruit in our lives. Dreams guide us into right action. So in other words, things that you have dreamt of since you were a child, things that you're dreaming now, the desires of your heart, what you're passionate about, these are the seeds of guidance about your offering to the world. What are you passionate about? What is pulling you forward? Set your intent, as did Martin Luther King, and who knows what could happen. He said, I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, and I love it because Alabama is where I came from, but Alabama, New York. <laughs> <laughs> Down in this Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope, and this is the faith that I go back to the South with. Yes, Martin Luther King desired to see a world that was different, vastly different from the one that he saw before his eyes. This is what dreams are about. Uh, there's a quote by Oscar Wilde, see if I have it here, it says that uh, dreamers are the ones who uh, see by the moonlight, like the bright light of day has not come yet. We, we dream and we see by the moonlight. And he went on to say that the only punishment for dreamers is that they are seeing something that others have not yet seen. So when you are in these dreaming states. You might not have a lot of uh, affirmation coming at you that your dreams can come true, but you draw on that spiritual power. And we can draw on the spiritual power of those that have gone before us, like Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, and know what has happened just in one generation and two generations that have changed everything. So, as Jesus said, your faith will heal you. That's what Martin was saying too. Your faith will lead you forward into doing things that are seemed impossible. And it's what led him forward into the South and so many others with him. And we're going to hear some of what that meant today from Natalie, how much faith and courage it took. So let's sing another of these spiritual songs together because that was such a big part of the um, infusion of faith, right? And the courage that they had. They were always singing. Always singing together. And the, they don't mind it being called the Negro Spirituals. You know, there's a website online that, that preserves all of the Negro Spirituals and um, has, has a whole list of them there that you can look at. And I'm so thrilled that we've got such great musicians that can bring them to us in great style. <laughs> this for 
first bit kind of slow. One, two, three. Sweet low. Sweet chariot. of the Judeo-Christian heritage for their encouragement and strength. I think lots of times we pass those scriptures off a little bit too quickly because, you know, we look at the church and sometimes we feel like the churches haven't lived up to what we hoped that those scriptures were really about. But on a day like today, it's a good day to hearken back to the truths that are there. They present a God of great unconditional love and restorative justice. And so I've asked Karen Douglas to come and read a brief portion out of the book of Isaiah, one of the great prophets, Isaiah 61. Okay. 
Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the suffering and afflicted. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, to announce liberty to captives, and to open the eyes of the blind. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of God's favor to them has come, and the day of his wrath to their enemies has come. <coughs> to all who mourn in Israel, he will give beauty for ashes, joy instead of mourning, praise instead of heaviness, for God has planted them like strong and graceful oaks in his own glory. Let me tell you how happy God has made me. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and draped about me the robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom in his wedding suit or a bride with her jewels. The Lord will show the nations of the world his restorative justice. All will praise the Creator. The righteousness of the Holy One shall be like a budding tree or like a garden in early spring, full of young plants springing up everywhere. And here's another passage from the book of Psalms, Psalms 36. I hope this inspires you to pick up that old Bible sometimes when you're feeling kind of low and need some encouragement and find some of these beautiful passages that are so powerful and poetic. This one's from the Message Bible, which is a very modern translation. Psalm 36. God's love is meteoric. Her loyalty, astronomic. God's purpose, titanic. His verdicts, oceanic. Yet in this largeness, nothing is lost. Not a man, not a mouse slips through the cracks. How exquisite is your love, O oh God. How eager we are to run under your wings, to eat our fill at the banquet that you spread as you fill our tankards with Eden spring water. You are a fountain of cascading light, and you open our eyes to light. Don't let the bullies kick us around. The moral midgets slap us down. <laughs> Keep on loving your friends, the ones who follow after your loving ways. Do your work in us of welcoming all hearts. Isn't that a beautiful translation? We see both in the prophet Isaiah and in Psalm 36 that, that God's call for justice is what rings through all of the scriptures. Whatever exile that we are returning from, God is calling us out of it and supporting us to come all the way through to the banquet tables of our lives. It says, they shall not only return, but they shall be restored. Vindication gives way to restoration, just like it did in South Africa, just like it's going to do more and more here in our country, because God's justice is restorative justice. It restores what has been lost. Punishment and retribution are human ideas, and at times we, we do experience the consequences of our actions, However, this is not what God desires. God desires justice, which is restorative, which means healing, which requires repentance from the offender, but also restores both the victim and the offender. Jerusalem was both the offender and the victim and experienced God's restoration in whole. And in Psalm 36, the psalmist sings of God's restoration to all who seek God because our God is faithful, and those who are faithful will experience God's abundance. So what does this mean to you? Being faithful, full of faith. Keep the faith alive. Keep on keeping on to see what the end will be, because it will be about restoration. 
the fullness of your dreams coming into being. Let's remain faithful to God's love and take stands when we have to take stands. Um, this next song that David's bringing to us is I Am Not a Victim. I Am Not a Victim. And I'm just going to say one more thing before David comes up to do it. And, and that is that um, I've enjoyed the Martin Luther King Day celebrations in this town very much. It's one of the highlights of the year for me. And one of those years, 2008, it was Nisha's year of graduating from high school. And she's my daughter. And she's of African-American descent and Caucasian. -y. <laughs> I get mixed up about it. <laughs> and um, she grew up here, went through high school here, and it wasn't always that easy in terms of racism. And so she was getting pretty beaten down feeling at times and went through a lot of difficult experiences that we as white folks don't experience and don't know about, even right here. And so in her senior year, she was in teen theater all through that time, and that, that was a very empowering experience. And the uh, Syl Stingle was a great leader of it, and she um, encouraged Nisha to write a play about her experience, and it was called Being Growing Up Brown in a White Town. And some of you may have remembered, but she presented this play at the big Martin Luther King Day event for maybe over 500 people there. And it was so moving because she named the facts of what had happened and how difficult it was in a very artistic way with, with the students enacting it with her. And at the end, she brought everyone through to a realization that we are one in our human hearts. So she, you know, did restorative justice. And at the end, she had everyone go like this and take each other's hands and go boom, 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 boom. And there wasn't a dry eye in that place. It really broke open the hearts of, of all of us, of the people of Ashland. And so, I am not a victim. I am not a victim. That's what it means to bring our dreams all the way through, you know, to proclaim we are not going to end up being victims. We're going to bring it all the way through. Amen, sister. Amen. Uh, you know, I, I thought about bringing this song into this service, and, and, and I wasn't clear why. I thought I was just being contrary. But it actually... You? Yeah. Um, <laughs> only you would know that. Yeah, really. um, is this like Sonny and Cher? Anyway. <laughs> the thing is, is that we, we see injustice, we know that it exists, but we know that it's not permanent. Why? Because it's not God's truth, and God's truth will out. We have to work to end injustice, but we can't get caught up in it and be a victim of it. Otherwise, we're, we're powerless. So... David and I wrote this chant uh, studying The Course in Miracles. This is actually a lesson in The Course in Miracles. I am not a victim of the world I see. Shall we tell them the lyrics so they can sing it with us? You just did it. <laughs> I am not a victim of the world I see. I am not a victim of the world I see because the world I see comes from me. And then we added, if I made it all up, I'm not going to take it so seriously. If I made it all up, I know I can see it more humorously. So those are all the lyrics. Because it's more fun. <laughs>
when our leaders learn to cry. Well, when our leaders learn to cry, when our leaders learn to cry. She wanted to be a part of that number. And we're so blessed to have leaders and elders like her in our midst, in our community, who have had these incredible experiences that we can learn from. And I'm so thankful to have Natalie Tyler here with us today. She's a therapist now in her life and in this community. And, and she's uh, just really uh, glad to be able to share with us today. So thank you, Natalie. Thank you so much for coming. of Unity Church of Maui. And I'm just thrilled to be here. It's so relaxing. I just love the way y'all do things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got my, my peaches all mixed up. <laughs> well, 150 years ago, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And on our, uh, when we marched, when we um, went on the trail to help Obama get elected, this is the song we sang. You may have heard this. <laughs> Abraham signed so Rosa could sit, Rosa sat so Martin could march, Martin marched so Barack could run, and Barack ran and he won, so that all our children could fly. <laughs> so proud to say that I knew Martin Luther King personally. I marched with him in Washington and Selma, and uh, Martin and Coretta, he asked me to call him Martin, and Coretta asked me to call her Coretta, and they stayed in our house in Cincinnati, and um, I just really got to know them well. I want to just tell you a little bit about the march in Washington, and a little bit about the time when they stayed in our house, but mostly I'm going to talk about my experience 
marching in Selma for many, several days. In Washington, D.C., in 1963, blacks and whites marched together for the first time on the Capitol. And there was no violence, and it was very exciting. And it was so exciting to stand there and watch the buses come in from all over the country. Uh, with Odetta, uh, Mah Mahala Jackson, Joan Baez, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Bob Dylan, Paul Newman, Mar Marlo, Martin, Marlon Brando, oh, I can't even tell you all those people, that just came in and they were singing, singing from getting off the buses. We were all just so excited. And Marian Anderson was supposed to sing the national anthem and her bus was late. And so she didn't get there in time. And Josephine Baker sang it for her. And Josephine Baker um, was a very famous dancer who left this country. She was an expatriate because she said being a, a black in this country didn't work. It was there was no way she could be treated right. And she said she would never came come back. But for that march, knowing that things were going to change, Josephine Baker came back and she sang the national anthem. And then when Marian Anderson got there, she sang, he's got the whole world in his hands. And then that was when Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech at Lincoln Memorial. And then Roy Wilkins, who was the president of NAACP at the time, said, you've got religion here today. Don't backslide tomorrow. Take it home to your cities. I took it home to my city and I helped organize and lead the Cincinnati March for Racial Equality in 1964. That year, the sharecroppers in Tennessee were kicked off their farms because they registered to vote. Um, Martin Luther King asked me, and Reverend McCracken, who was, uh, taught us so much, uh, and he was a unity minister, his, uh, his um, church was called the Church of, for All People. And um, so Reverend McCracken asked me if Dr. If the Fed, first he asked me if the people from Tennessee who'd been kicked off their farms could come and stay at our house. And he said that Martin Luther King said it would be so good for them to stay at a home where white people treated them as equals. And then he said, how would you feel about a minister and his wife from the South coming and staying at your house? And I thought, well, yes, some minister, who knows? And I said yes. And it turned out to be Dr. Martin Luther King and his wife, Coretta. It was so amazing. It was just so amazing uh, to have them in my house. And uh, uh, that part of it, the way they treated each other with so much kindness and love. And one day, I came down to fix breakfast. And Martin and Coretta were standing at the table with their holding each other's hands, praying. They set the table. It was all set for breakfast. And um, so we had breakfast, and they helped clean up too. And then afterwards, Martin uh, went into my library, which was a room right off the kitchen. And he came back and he said, Natalie, thank you for the books you read. Woo! That's the first time anybody ever thanked me for what I read. <laughs> well, so um, uh, those sharecroppers uh, got, were able to, the law came through, and they were able to go back and uh, live on their farms, even though they registered to vote. So the next year, in 1965, and that was 48 years ago, is there anybody, how many people here were not even born 40 years ago? Woo! So, there were, that was the year that we went on the Selma March, and there were 25,000 of us. That's more than the city, the people who live in Ashland, than the population of Ashland. So there were 25,000 of us who marched 40 miles, 12 miles a day, from Selma to Montgomery. John Lewis, who is now a congressman, but then he was the head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, he had some anger in his speech. He said, if they don't give us our rights, we'll take over. 
and we'll get them ourselves. And Dr. King said, no, we want you to give a speech with love in it. That speech won't work for us. But the policeman in Selma knocked him down and beat him up and gave him a, a, skull, oh. a skull fracture. Well, uh, President Johnson sent in the federal troops, so we had no more violence after that. We were able to walk across the bridge from Selma on our way to Montgomery with absolutely no, no more problems from the uh, police in the, in the South. We marched because African Americans, and then we called them colored or Negroes, they had no jobs except as maids, janitors, garbage collectors, and of course the cotton pickers. Black children went to separate schools. During our march, I saw some of those schools. Torn down, very few books, books that the white kids had the year before that were torn up and had notes on them from the white kids from the years before. And there were some schools that, where they didn't have any books at all. And um, African Americans were not allowed to go to movies. There were some that had balconies, so they could sit in a few of the ones with balconies. They were not allowed at any restaurants except to clean up. And they had to sit in the back of the buses and stand even if there were seats in the front. And, and the back of the buses were all filled with the black people. So they were not allowed to vote. And innocent little children be, were singing, we shall overcome with their hands locked, and the police put through hoses on them. Uh, it, uh, they came, the police came with the guns and put just cold, cold hoses on those kids. And um, so we needed to do this march to change all that. We slept in churches, we slept in African American people's shacks, and we slept in the fields in the rain. But we did our walk all the way from Selma to Montgomery. And there were black and brown people who brought us sandwiches and brought us water. And we had our own marshals standing all along the march with peace and justice signs on their arms. And there were some white people who stood up on a hill, and this was toward the beginning of the march, and they threw rocks at our heads. And I still had a bump from that rock. It's all right. That bump reminds me of a lot of good things. And um, so we followed Dr. King's teachings. We did not fight back. As they threw the rocks on our heads, we had our arms interlocked and we were singing, We Shall Overcome, and other freedom songs. There were just so many freedom songs that we sang. So then when we were marching, all of us, blacks and whites together, we, can't, people, we had to go to the bathroom, our, our row of people. The black said colored on one and said white on another. We were all together. We weren't going to segregate. So we went to the black bathroom. The toilets didn't flush. It wasn't very nice, but that's what we did. We weren't going to break a law by going into the white bathroom. We went all together. Also, the same thing happened with the drinking fountains. It was colored. Some of the drinking fountains didn't work. You could just, the dribble came out. The white drinking fountains were fine. But we got a little water from where it said colored. Um, we, one time, I, we, well, some of us had to go to the bathroom. And we went into an a, 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 a African-American woman's house to go to the bathroom. And she said to me, you're a medical doctor, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not. Why do you think that? She said, because only medical doctors know that we're all the same inside. Oh. She, she said, I never knew a white person who just treated me like I, I was a person. And she said, and, and you, you act like you know. <laughs> and so she, she, I guess she had a lot of experiences of not being treated right by white people. Um, when we were marching, we had a good time together because we just felt so much community. And I dropped a Kleenex. My husband knows I have this habit of 
blowing my nose and dropping a Kleenex. And there was an older black man who was marching with me at the time. He bent down to get the Kleenex and he said, we're not going to leave any white trash here <laughs> except the white trash that's already here. <laughs> there, there was another time when I was marching and there was a young black man um, uh, uh, with our arms interlocked and he said, you know, I never touched a white woman before. Your skin doesn't feel any different from any black person's skin. And um, the, one of the most moving things for me, I was marching for a long time with a woman from Detroit. Her name was Viola Louisa. And we talked and we got to be such good friends and we marched for so many miles together and she, she told me all about her five kids in Detroit. And we promised each other we would write and visit each other and stay and be friends forever. We stopped talking after a while because I feel it now in my memory how our throats were parched. We hadn't had any water for a long time. And so we, could, we just we stopped talking because we both said, oh my gosh, we need water. Just then, some young black men came in a car, by in a car, and said, we're going for jugs of water. Who wants to go with us? We have room for only one person in the car because we got all these jugs we're going to get. I wanted to get in and go. So I started to get in the car, and Viola said, no, I'm getting in. And um, she's a little, a little stronger and bigger than I was, I guess. We had this little fight, but she got in the car, and I didn't. She never came back. She was shot and killed for dry, being in a car with two, a white woman being in a car with two young black men. We were, we kept marching and we didn't know, and we didn't find out till much later that the Ku Klux Klan had shot her. So I'm glad now I didn't get in the car, but I brought a Kleenex, Kleenex up I'll probably drop it, because <laughs> uh, when I think about her getting to know her so well, and uh, I almost got in that car. So it's so important that we all keep working for justice and peace for equality for everybody. I remember when we weren't singing, sometimes people were talking. And um, I, I mentioned to you before, Reverend McCracken, his church was called uh, uh, the Church for All People. And um, he said, when we were marching, he said, you know, uh, Dr. King should be president of our country. And Reverend Fred Shovelsworth, who's a very well-known civil rights leader, who just died in his 90s uh, about four years ago, um, he said, no. No colored man will ever be president of our country. Not in our time. You know, it's just not going to happen. Well, it happened. We've got President Obama. So I don't believe that could have happened, that we could have had a black president if we hadn't done the nonviolent protest marches in the 60s. So following Dr. King's practice of nonviolence, is how we've made a difference. And we've come a long way, but we've still got a long way to go. One person can make a difference, and each person here can make a difference. Well, finally, we arrived after many, many long marches, walking. We finally arrived in Montgomery, where Dr. King spoke. He said, the end we seek is a society at peace with itself, a society that can live with its conscience. So after we hear, heard him, we went to the airport to go home. Uh, those of us who were from Cincinnati met, and um, we, we, were at, we were pretty hungry and we were pretty thirsty. We met at the airport, at the, we sat down at the airport restaurant. We were blacks and whites together. The waitress said, I can't serve you. We followed Dr. King's instructions, his training. We said, thank you so much for telling us in such a nice, polite way. And we understand you're doing your job, and you can't lose your job. 
thank you so much. And we got up and left. The waitress came to the door with a big jug of water and a big bag of cookies. And she said, I didn't understand what this was all about before, but you've taught me so much. I feel so differently now. And, and she slipped us the water and the jugs. It was just such an amazing feeling. So we got all on the plane and we took an oath that if ever we heard anybody speak about any group of people in a prejudiced way, we would speak up and say, I don't believe that. I don't agree with that. And we would work for change. We all took the oath. And I've just seen and been in touch with a few people since then. And I believe that we are all keeping the oath. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, taught us to have nonviolence and peace in our hearts and kindness in our actions. He taught me to open my heart wider and to go deeper into my soul. He believed that the true axis of evil was war, poverty, and prejudice. If he were here to get today, he would be a peaceful warrior against our immoral wars, and he would be peacefully working to stop our government from invading other countries and waging wars, and people here killing each other with guns. Against, he was against the Vietnam War. He said, I fought too hard against segregation to now segregate my moral concerns. He said, one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creeds. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal. And he gave me a sign that I keep on my desk, and I will always have it on my desk. And it says, our lives begin to end when we become silent about things that matter. And that's why I'm talking here today. And I talk each year on his birthday. And I think what we all need to do is work for the good, for equal marriage so people same sex can marry each other, uh, and to stop the bullying of GLBT children in schools, and for immigration reform, and the South is still keeping blacks from voting in some places. And we've all got to speak up and find a way to do it. And, and there are many groups to join who are working on these things. And I just feel so good about talking here today. I just feel like you're all with me. And I know everybody here can make a difference. I'm so moved to be back here at a community church with marvelous Norma and, and the, pre, the, the music at how we're all together here. This is a very wonderful experience for me. And um, I think you're going to do some drumming or some, yeah, and then I'm going to do some humming. Humming. What? You're going to do something. We're just going to kind of <laughs> accompany you. <laughs> My poem is The Road from Selma. from Selma in the rain, white as a shroud. Over in Mississippi, Medgar, Edvin, Medgar ever stands. Three young men rise up from a dam in Neshoba County, and they all go down the road and walk right through the tight, stiff trooper line and down the road from Selma. And from all over, there's a stirring sound 
Emmett Till jumps up and runs like a laughing boy through the stiff white rain. And the tall old man in Springfield gets up, Lincoln, and goes to Selma. And down from every lynching tree and up from every hidden grave come men, women, children, heads carried high, passing a moment among the bowed, skilled troopers and down the white road from Selma. And Till the age long road is packed, black with marchers streaming to the courthouse. And the bowed still group in Selma raise their hands, hands joined and raise their heads, swaying gently in soft, strong sound that goes right through the stiff, ranked troopers, white as a shroud, barring the road from Selma. Wanted you to know that because it is because of you 
in your love for her, that she has the strength to do that today. And all you that know her know she's pretty shy. And so right now, as we're meeting, she is going and doing that. And she says, Mom, maybe me speaking up, maybe that'll change it for other interns. Maybe that'll change it for those who come after me. And I, I'm going to do this. And I said, honey, I'm going to tell the people. And we're all there for you and praying for you. So sometimes it doesn't, the dreams don't just come true easily, you know. Like we do have to take stands, stands that are hard to take. And I just thank Natalie again for her life and all that she did. And I thank every one of you for taking stands in difficult moments and for loving me and loving Nisha and helping our, our dreams, our collective dreams to come true. Let's sing again. Let's sing We Shall Overcome Today. We have Amen. overcome. We have overcome. We have overcome death. Truth and trust, and so it is. And so it is. 